Good evening all, and welcome. I'd like to start off this video by saying thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you for subscribing and watching these videos. Our community has now grown to an incredible 50,000, for which I am very, very grateful indeed. I am humbled at the vast number of you that enjoy my work. Just so that you know, at the end of the video I'm going to be saying a few things about my personal life that you might be interested to hear. So, stick around if you want to hear them. To celebrate this accomplishment, I thought I'd bring you what I think is one of your all-time favourite topics as a collective. So get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. Number 1. The man who told me about his terrifying experience in the Colorado wilderness is one of those distant relatives that everyone has. They're your third cousin, twice removed, or something to that effect. I'm not positive how exactly we're related, but he is an incredible guy. Greg is a decorated green beret with a silver star to his name that he earned by capturing the leader of an Afghan sniper cell without incurring any casualties. Despite his status as a huge badass and his not unconsiderable size of 6 foot 3 and 200 pounds, Greg is a teddy bear. He is an extremely humble and kind person. I've had a lot of experiences in the outdoors, having lived in Colorado for most of my life. And Greg and I have had extended conversations about our adventures in the woods at my grandma's house for Thanksgiving. We were sitting on the couch, wearing tacky holiday sweaters, when the conversation turned to hunting. Greg mentioned offhandedly that he used to be an avid hunter, but had an experience that turned him off it. He said he doesn't even like guns anymore something I found surprising coming from such an accomplished soldier. I pushed him to tell me what happened, and thought he seemed uncomfortable with the idea, but he finally relented and did tell me. I'm going to switch this to first person now, to tell it to you in the same way that Greg told this story to me. It was late October, which means elk season up in Indian Peaks Wilderness, and I went up there to bag a few elk and just relax for a few days by myself. I parked the truck near a trailhead about 8 miles from where I wound up setting up camp and was looking forward to a nice weekend in the woods with some peace and quiet after packing all my gear in and getting ready. The first morning, I was in my deer blind about 20 feet up a tree with a cup of coffee and my rifle. The sun had just come up about an hour ago. About 50 yards from my tree, the tree line ended and opened into this big meadow where a lot of the elk tended to roll through, and I could sight my rifle pretty well through the trees and see most of this big grassy area. Perhaps a couple of hours had passed, which isn't really boring in the deep woods. I just drank coffee from my thermos and listened to all the life around me, feeling the woods getting ready for winter. I couldn't believe my luck, when I glanced over at the meadow, and saw a large group of elk had started grazing in the meadow. The silent animals plodded along, oblivious to me watching. Among the group was one of the most beautiful elk I had ever seen. It's what was called a monarch which mean it had antlers with eight points each, something really rare. I quietly clicked the safety of my rifle and sighted it. When you're hunting an animal like this, you want to put a bullet right where the skull meets the spine, in order to sever the spinal column and kill it instantly and painlessly. The focus, when you get it in the zone, is incredible. I swear I could feel the firing pin punch forward and the bullet would leave the barrel as I pulled the trigger. That beautiful elk went down silently 
and all the others scattered for the tree line. I was ecstatic about the shot and the elk as I climbed down out of the blind and set off for the meadow. I had left my rifle in my blind, something I regretted soon, and had only my small knife on me to gut the animal and drag it back to camp. As I was making the short walk between my blind and the meadow, I noticed that the woods around me were completely silent. Some of this is normal after you fire a gun in the woods, but for it to drag on this long was unsettling. I thought nothing of it, and continued to walk the short walk through the dense pines, as I was about to clear the trees and step into the meadow. I noticed something odd. I could see the elk's body lying in the grass through the trees, but there was something else. There was what looked like another elk antlers and all, on the opposite side of the dead elk from where I was coming to walk out of the tree line, almost looking as though it were gently nuzzling the elk's dead body. This was weird, to see an elk treat a dead elk like this. They usually scatter, but I continued walking towards it, trapezing in the duff and hollering in an attempt to startle this other elk off. It snapped its head and looked up at me. Over the body of its fallen friend, this strange new elk eyed me with an unafraid glare. I say glare, because it didn't feel like an animal looking at me anymore. Its glassy black eyes gave me the same caught, red-handed feeling that you got when your parents would catch you doing something wrong. I felt suddenly uncomfortable and out of place in the woods that I loved so much, and somehow hated and guilty. I no longer wanted the elk, and I stopped dead in my tracks, and watched this animal, and it eyed me angrily. What it did next gives me nightmares to this day. The thing that stood before me on the other side of the dead elk must have been lying on its stomach and it put its arms down and pushed up, putting its legs underneath it. It reared back, glaring at me, along with its evil glass eyes. My breath caught in my throat. Most of its body was at least somewhat human, but terribly emaciated and elongated. It appeared to stand at least ten feet tall, not including the antlers atop of the elk's head. It was bald everywhere but the neck up. It looked stickly pale and pink. Its legs at the knee bent backwards, like the back legs of an elk. This horrible, skinny, naked, unnatural thing just stood there, glowering at me, with a hatred that was palpable. The woods around us were silent. It might have been a second, minute or hours. I felt the disapproving parent feeling shift. I felt more like an ant under a shoe. I took a step back. My boots felt ten pounds. My body felt numb. And the noise of my footstep was ear-splitting. I took one more and then ran. Running through thick woods is tough. But I ran faster than I have ran in my life. I passed under my blind with my $4,000 rifle sitting in it, without even slowing down. I ran all the way back to my camp, which must have been a mile, before I stopped and took my breath. It took me another minute to dare to look behind me. I was alone, but the woods around me were still silent and brooding. I wanted more than anything to pack up and go home, but I knew that I could not make it back to the car before nightfall and I didn't want to be exposed at night. I cooked an MRE in my tent and stayed there for the rest of the night. When night fell, I wrapped myself in my sleeping bag and tried to sleep, but I couldn't stop myself from starting at every little noise. I kept thinking about possible rational explanations for what I saw. Maybe there's a crazy guy out there who found an elk head and is wearing it around scaring people but no explanation I came up with quelled the maddening feeling of fear that I felt, the horrible sense of being hated and guilty 
and far from home. And nothing explained why that thing was ten feet tall with inverted knees. As soon as the sun came up, I ran back to the blind and took it down. Then, I ran back to camp with my rifle and pack, packed everything up, and hiked out. I've never fired a gun in the woods since, and I don't intend to ever again. I'm not a spiritual person. But if that wasn't something in the forest telling me to leave it alone, I don't know what is. I can take a hint. I don't think I'll ever know exactly what that creature was. But I know what I saw. Next time you're up in the woods alone, be quiet, be respectful, and don't kill anything that you don't have to. I thought at first that Greg's story was too far-fetched to be true. But as he told it, I saw how truly scared he was. This confident, softly spoken military man was stuttering through his story, hands shaking and face pale. I still don't know what to make of it. But the area he said it occurred is one I'm quite familiar with, and it can be an eerie place. Sometimes, being alone in the woods can feel like anything but. It just might be that there's some force out there, some inhuman creature who guards the woods. Just in case, I take extra care to be respectful whenever I'm among nature. You never know who could be watching. Number two. I'm not convinced there is an afterlife, or such a thing as ghosts or demons, but I once saw something in the woods that felt so unnatural, it made me second guess how I see the world. I was hiking up a hillside, thick with trees, in the middle of the night during a long weekend. Some friends and I decided we would hike to the top of the hill and light off some fireworks. Approaching the hill and surrounding the base of the hill was a rolling grass valley. It was around midnight, full moon, and a light mist, something straight out of a horror movie. The strange part was, I wasn't nervous or scared or anything. I was having a great night with my buddies. I didn't have any of my defences up. My buddies and I just hiked in a straight line through the rolling grass valley approaching the hill, when something caught my eye. On my right, I saw a tall shadowy figure standing perfectly upright on the top of a small grassy hill. It was standing there right next to a large dead tree. I couldn't make out any details. Both the tree and the tall figure were silhouetted underneath the moonlight. The strange part was seeing this figure didn't scare me. I didn't immediately sense any threat. I almost assumed it might have just been another hiker or somebody having a smoke. I passively turned my flashlight on it, and that's when it happened. In an instant, as my light hit the spot where the figure was standing, it instantly moved just outside the range of my flashlight, like it teleported or something. But just as vividly, I saw it standing in its initial spot as my light hit that spot and the figure moved. I could see it standing just outside my range of light. My breath paused in an instant and a wave of dread washed over me. Something felt a hundred percent unnatural about what just happened. As a reflex, I moved my light to the new spot where the figure was, and as my light passed it, it disappeared. I've never passed out in my entire life. Not from heat, not from getting knocked out. Never. But in that moment, I felt my knees give way from underneath me and I fell to the ground. My friends turned and looked at me, trying to pick myself up from my knees, and they were too wobbly to stand. They helped me and I tried explaining to them what I experienced. Perhaps it was all just shadows and lights and my eyes messing with me. But I'll never be able to explain that sensation. The feeling, 
the feeling like I had just seen something, something I shouldn't have seen, something so unnatural that my body's instinctual reaction was to just go limp. Number three. My father used to have a business in maintaining the woods. It's a thing in my country. It basically means cutting down dead trees and hauling them out of the area, as well as generally being a tree surgeon. This means that he was out in the woods all day, and he was allowed in places normal citizens couldn't go to because of the rules of the Forestry Commission. My dad was working in the early morning when he suddenly noticed a car in the middle of the woods. It drove through a small path normally only used by the foresters. It wasn't a car from the Forestry Commission, so he thought it was very weird. However, dad was alone and it was the 80s, so there were no mobile phones to contact anyone. Since it was in the middle of nowhere, he decided to ignore it. He kept on hauling wood through the woods with his horse, and he suddenly heard the men speaking. Now my dad is a brave man, and as strong as a bear, so he decided to just have a quick peek to see what the hell those folks were doing. My dad looked around some thick bushes to make sure he could see the men. They were digging a hole. My father decided that it was something he really didn't want to interrupt, and he kept working throughout the day like nothing ever happened. He made sure to keep some distance between him and the digging site. The men apparently never noticed my dad, possibly because his equipment wasn't located in the same direction that the men came from, and my father worked with horses, so they weren't any loud machines. It was the 80s after all. At the end of the day, my father went to the local commission office and reported it, and they called the police. After they went to investigate, they found a body of a young woman buried there. It still irks my dad to this day. He was out there alone. What if the man saw him? What if he decided to check the burial ground out himself? Scary shit. Number four. A few weeks ago, we were on a road trip from British Columbia to San Diego, and we came upon a campsite just outside of Crescent City, California. We drove through it, one side of the campground was relatively empty, and I noticed a few scattered tents, but nobody close to the location we ended up picking. We had tons of space. We wanted an early night. So I started a fire whilst my girlfriend began cooking. We ate it, had a few beers, and climbed into our rooftop tents, with our dog by 9pm or so. I had a rough time sleeping, and woke up a few times, but finally fell into a decent sleep. In the pitch dark, with all of our tent windows and canvases closed, I was awoken at 1am by someone whistling outside our tent the tune of When the Saints Come Marching In. After a few minutes of this repetitive whistling, I nudged my girlfriend who awoke and was obviously freaked out as well. The whistling then turned to chanting things like, when you sleep, you disrespect me. When you disrespect me, you disrespect the US Marines. The person would then start spelling out words like flee and the verbiage and tone kept getting more aggressive, so we decided we had to make a move. I slowly unzipped the tent whilst our guard dog was snoring, and got my head out of the tent. I took a few seconds to let my eyes adjust, and figure out where the person was. I felt more confident once I could somewhat see and hear, so I climbed down and my girlfriend passed me the dog, and she climbed down too. We flipped the tent up without securing it, and we jumped to the truck, while the person was still whistling. We went to a motel in Crescent City. The next morning we drove back to get a few belongings that weren't in the truck, 
and a family who had been camping a few sites over said it went over for two or three hours and it was the scariest thing that their family had ever experienced. Number five. When I was young, my dad lived in an old log cabin about 15 miles west of Sheridan, Wyoming, in the foothills of Bighorn Mountain. Every summer when I was visiting, we would go up to the mountains backpacking and fishing for two days every weekend. We would park the truck, hike into a remote area, fishing for trout along the way, and make camp wherever we ended up. We encountered a number of strange and creepy things, and got into some scary situations with wildlife. But the situation that sticks out with me the most was an ancient abandoned camp we found. We were hiking down a very steep slope to get to an area of a creek that had been dammed up by beavers, hoping to catch some big trout. I had climbed out on a rock ledge and was looking for a way down when I saw the stock and action of an old rusty rifle sticking out of a tree where the tree had grown around the barrel for years before. It was around 10 feet above the ground. Dad and I climbed down to check it out, and we found a small cave at the base of the rock, a formation only about 12 inches deep, which would make a nice natural shelter, but a really terrible place to set up a long-term camp. Inside, we found a bunch of really old stuff. Three heavy-gauge unopened cans of food, an old cast iron pot that had holes rusted in all the way through, a crusty old saddle and bridle set, a very deteriorated heavy woolen blanket rolled up and tied with a leather belt. When we unwrapped the blanket, we found several personal items, including a rusty old cap, a ball black powder revolver, a leather satchel with a lead pistol shot, and a powder horn with no black powder in it, tarnished old cartridges, presumably for the rifle in the tree, a straight razor, and most unsettling of all, was a shirt with holes in it, and over half of it stained with dried blood. As we stood there thinking about what all of this meant, it occurred to me how remote this place was, even at the time of July 1985 and the fact that whoever owned that shirt had been very seriously injured. Stuck on a steep slope in the middle of absolutely nowhere, I got serious chills down my spine. The only thing that somewhat dated this fateful campsite was the pistol and the rifle, both of which were made sometime in the 1870s according to my father. There's no way to ever know what happened to the man who owned all this stuff, but the fact that he, or someone he knew, obviously shot twice with either a gun or arrow, and all of his belongings were sitting right there where he left them possibly a hundred years later, it was highly unlikely that he left the area alive. Discovering what amounts to an 100 year old crime scene in this very remote wilderness kind of gave me the creeps, but mostly, it just made me sad to know how hopeless and alone this guy must have felt when he died. I asked my dad if I could keep the pistol, and he simply said, It's not mine to give, and we're not thieves. He chose instead to teach me a lesson about respecting the dead and preserving history. He had been very careful inspecting everything, and we put everything back exactly as we had found it. My dad then told me to take my hat off and observe a moment of silence and reflection as a sign of respect for the man who most likely lost his life on that mountain. Then we went fishing. I tried several times over the years to find that spot again, especially now that I have sons of my own. But sadly, I've never been able to find it. Number 6 a few years back, we were doing a massive survey in the middle of nowhere in the interior of British Columbia. All the crews had gone home, 
and it was just my boss and myself left for a few days to follow up and confirm some coordinates and finish some mapping. We head out of the motel, an hour or so into the bush, middle of nowhere along deactivated logging roads. The closest town is miles and miles away, and we hike out to one area that we had found a few weeks previously. For some reason, the whole area just felt off. So we get down to business, and about 15 minutes after being haunched over mapping, there is this weird deafening womp sound, like I could feel pressure in my ears. I immediately looked at my boss about 20 feet away, and he is white as a ghost staring back at me, standing, and then it happens again. My ear and chest pressure go crazy, and it feels like I am being squeezed, chills all over my body, and every hair is standing on end. My boss just looks at me and says, let's go. We grab all of our stuff and speed hike back to the truck. We never discussed it. No clue what it was, but I've never been so freaked out in my life. Thinking about it 10 years later, I still get the chills. Number seven. I was camping in the Florida Keys one winter. I managed to survive the large snakes, and even larger alligators, as well as the scorpions which would get into my shoes at night. But one experience that I shall never forget. My campsite was next to an old rock quarry, which had filled with water, and made it a good place for swimming and getting water from. There was also an old dump site near the quarry, with piles of stoves and fridges and other junk. It had been there for a while, but nothing new had been added to it for a long time. One day, a fellow shows up and tells me that they were going to clean up the dump and burn some of the junk, so I better move my tent. So I gather up all of my belongings and moved a few hundred yards back into the woods. That day, they started burning the garbage and I thought nothing about it until I climbed into my tent at night. As soon as it got dark, and I was falling asleep, my tent became covered with hundreds of rats. I guess they had moved out of the dump because of the fire, and were just wandering around looking for food. They were everywhere, climbing up my ropes and over the top of the tent. I shook as many as I could off, and started a fire, and stayed up all night hoping they wouldn't return. They seemed to be gone, so the next night, I stayed in the same place thinking they had moved to another dump or something. But no. As soon as it got dark, they all returned, bringing some of their friends, as it seemed that they were more than ever. I again shook them off my tent and got the fire going. When morning came, I packed up my tent and headed for a new place far away from those rats. As I was walking down the highway, wondering if I should return to another camping spot that I had previously been in, there, on the highway, near to the place, was a dead 11 foot alligator, which had crawled out from the mangroves only a few feet from where I had been camping a few weeks prior. I decided that my Florida camping adventure had gone on long enough, and headed home. Number 8. When I was 18, me and my friends took a road trip about 7 hours or so down to Apichicola National Forest near Tallahassee, Florida. We were going to do a little car camping, drinking a few ice cold native lights, you know, 18 year old stuff. As we didn't want to be bothered by any park rangers, we drove way deep into the woods. We got there, set up camp and had said natey lights. And me and a guy decided to do a little exploring. So we walked about a hundred yards from our site back to the main road, saw another path directly across from us, and started walking. Immediately we started seeing signs that someone had been living there for a while. Big bags of trash, stuff like that. 
I should have seen a huge red flag and turned around. But you know, I'm 18 and nothing can hurt me. So we get to this campsite of an older white guy living out of his van. Clothesline strung up, coolers placed around it, and a big gorgeous dog which I think was a golden retriever. We tried to back out, but he sees us and starts up a conversation. He's friendly enough and asks us where we're from, and he tells us some cool spots to check out. We ended up chatting to him for about 10 minutes, and then we went on our way. I kept thinking how odd it was that he gave directions in steps, not yards or miles. The guy seemed to be off balance, not stumbling drunk, but like he was walking on a balance beam, swaying side to side. Oh, and he was super excited to talk about national parks and forests and where we were from. So we went back to our tents. Fast forward two months, the same buddy calls me late at night and tells me to turn on the TV to the news. I oblige, and I see an old dude with a van. You see where this is heading, but I didn't. So I get pissed at my friend for waking me, and he insists that I should watch. And when I see the golden retriever, it all clicks. The man's name was Gary Michael Hilton, convicted of at least four murders. He kidnapped and murdered a girl on Blood Mountain, Georgia, an older couple in Pisgah, North Carolina, and a girl in Apila Chicola at the campsite not long after we left. Yes, the very same places he had been talking to us about. Obviously, we called the cops, and they put us in touch with the FBI. We get flown down to take investigators to the campsite, point out every spot we saw, and tell them exactly what he told us, and show them the places he described to us. I didn't find out until after the trial, but apparently, they found what appeared to be partially destroyed human finger bones in an area near the site, and I had to be flown down again to testify. Number 9 17 or 18 years ago, my fiancé, now wife of nearly 16 years, and myself, and one other couple were hiking the Pyramid Point hiking trail in the Sleeping Bear Dunes of northwestern lower peninsula of Michigan at dusk. We had my old film camera with a 200mm zoom lens on it. We got to the Overlook, which looks northwest over the Manitou Passage to the Manitou Islands. We watched the sunset and entered that late dusk period that seems to last forever during a northern Michigan summer. It was probably 10pm at this point. There were high winds and solid waves breaking on the shore below us. While standing and talking, we saw a light flash once out in the water between the islands and the mainland, in the vicinity of North Manitou Shoal Lighthouse. We stopped and looked, but weren't creeped out by it. After all, boaters are out in this stretch of water fairly regularly. I grabbed my camera and looked through the zoom lens, and I could make out what appeared to be a small boat, though it was difficult to tell with a 200mm lens, as it's a 7 mile wide stretch of water to the nearest island, so we were probably 3-4 to four miles away from the actual light. We had flashlights, so we shined our lights in the direction of the light that we'd seen, waved it around, and immediately the light came back, and started flashing SOS in Morse code, which was a huge surprise to us. We weren't even sure our lights were bright enough to be seen at that distance, and given the stretch of shore, it's almost all forested. We were just a little spot several miles away, we were suddenly full of adrenaline and concern. Two of us ran back to the cars, which is half a mile through the woods in the dark down a hill with our flashlights, and got a cell phone and binoculars. While we were gone, the folks on the lookout had no light source. At the car, we called the Coast Guard from our cell phones. It was 1999, so these weren't smartphones by any stretch of imagination. 
We explained to the Coast Guard that someone was flashing SOS at us, out in the water, and that we were hikers, observing from Pyramid Point Overlook. They said that they would send a ship to look over the area, and we asked them to hurry. At this point, we ran back up to our overlook, with binoculars and phone and flashlight. Atop the overlook, there was no cell signal, so we had to pocket the phone and had no further communications with the Coast Guard. With our binoculars, we were able to see a guy in an aluminium rowboat, rowing like crazy, with waves breaking over the bow of his boat. It was nearly pitch black outside, so we were only barely able to make the sound. It was about 10.30 or 45 at this point. During Michigan summer, it's still light enough to see outside. But anyway, he would occasionally turn around and flash SOS at us, and go back to rowing. It was disturbing to be several miles away, completely helpless, whilst we watched this guy struggling in a rowboat in the dark. It got dark, and we could not see anything anymore, but every few minutes the man in the boat would flash SOS. He did not appear to be making any progress towards the mainland, but he was clearly drifting northwestwards through the Manitou Passage. Every time he flashed, we turn on our flashlight and shine it back at him for a few seconds and turn it off. We did not know Morse code and had no cell signal. We stood and watched for what seemed like forever, completely helpless. The man stopped flashing his light, and it was too dark to see his boat. And then a tugboat appeared, that did not appear to be the Coast Guard's ship, showed up and started doing a grid search pattern through the passage, with bright lights shining from around the water. The Manitou Passage is probably six to seven miles wide, and six to seven miles long, so it was a slow search and a smallish Coast Guard ship started doing searches at the northern end of the Straits, also with bright lights. They met in the middle of the Straits, having done a zigzag type pattern for what felt like an eternity, then sailed off. They didn't find anyone. We drove into a bar in Glen Arbor to see if there was anything on the news, and there wasn't. We called the Coast Guard the next morning, wondering if we'd seen a man die or help to rescue. But the person on duty had no idea what happened, or that we'd even called the night before. So to this day, it's unsettling to me, knowing how harsh the conditions on Lake Michigan can be, and knowing that we'd seen a man flashing SOS at us through our binoculars just before it got dark was really bothersome. There's no closure, no happy or sad ending, no ending at all, other than going back to our camp and hitting the sack. I have no idea what happened to him, and I really doubt I ever will. Number 10. I was hiking and backpacking with two friends in Montana. We were probably five miles from the nearest paved road, and had hiked around two miles from the end of the dirt road. The spot isn't very well travelled, and is quite nondescript, but we all enjoyed getting away from any crowds, and being out relatively alone, so we always gravitated to areas like this, for backcountry camping. We built a fire and hung out, then piled into our tent. All is normal, and we hadn't seen a soul, or any recent sign of people, since we left the paved roads. I have some trouble sleeping, and was sort of just laying there for maybe 30 minutes, and both my buddies passed out. That's when it got weird. I hear from my side of the tent a murmuring, which I was certain was a person making sounds underneath their breath. It didn't feel like real words, but almost like someone drunk was mumbling gibberish. My first thought was one of my buddies was sleep talking. I listened closer, and it was definitely coming from outside. 
I woke up my friend closest to me, and he woke me up with a, what? A little irritated, and at the moment, the muttering stopped. I shooed him, and whispered to him what I'd heard. We waited a second and it started again, but it seemed closer this time, and he heard it too, but we didn't hear any movement. I can still hear the voice, and it really messes with me ten years later. He gave me a what the hell face, and proceeded to gesture that he was going to unzip the door and see what was outside. Right as he starts moving the zipper, we heard what sounded like someone taking a huge gasp of air before diving into a pool, seemingly from the opposite side of the tent of where we heard the original muttering from. We both froze for a second before he pushed his flashlight out and looked in that direction and screamed, Who's out there? We didn't see anything, and never heard a single twig or the sound of movement. But this time, my other friend had woken up, and we were all still freaking out. We told him what was up, and we all took our flashlights out to see what the hell it was, and we saw nothing at all. We were both up for a long time after that, while the sleeping friend was out again fairly shortly thereafter. We didn't hear another odd sound at all, and in the morning there were no signs that anyone had been there. We cut our trip to just that night, and moved back to a campground the following day. We still have no idea what or who was outside our tent. The only thing that we could even make a semblance of a sense of was an owl, bat, or another bird. But I've spent many nights outdoors in that habitat, and I am familiar with those noises. This was entirely different in my opinion, and didn't come from any animal I'm aware of anyway. Still gives me chills thinking about it. Number 11. I have a couple of stories about camping. One year, I was working for the forestry for the summer, so I decided to camp out by where the work was. I would go into town only once or twice a month for supplies. On the forestry road on the way there, there was a fellow camping a few miles from my setup. He wasn't working with me, so I figured maybe he was a hunter or something. After a couple of times of passing his campsite, and seeing that his car was never moved, I decided that if the car was still there by the next time I drove by, I'd stop to see if he was okay. Thankfully, as it turned out, one of my fellow co-workers had the same thought, and he got there first. He could tell by the smell when he approached the guy's trailer that there was something seriously wrong, and when he went inside, he found the guy with maggots crawling out of where his eyes had been. It was a hot summer, and his body had been there for quite a while before my buddy found him. My buddy guessed it was a heart attack or something, and he reported it to the police and they dealt with it. But we never heard any more about it. Here are two stories. Both take place in the Rocky Mountain region. We don't like to camp in campgrounds because we're antisocial, and none of us care to share a campground with a stranger screaming kids, waving around their flaming hot s'more pokers. When we go camping, we do mild off-road and camp in clearings, away from the people. Just after high school, me and my friends decide to celebrate by going out on a camping trip. We ended up leaving way later than we had planned. It was dark by the time we got up into the mountains, and the camping spot was about an hour or so from home. We didn't want to turn around. So we just decided to make due and set up camp in the first decent clearing that we found, and would figure things out in the morning. We all set up our tents in the dark, moonless night, and just went straight to bed. When we woke up, we realised that we had unwittingly set up camp on top of someone's abandoned attempt of a marijuana farm. Not wanting to deal with that shit, we packed up pretty quickly and moved on. The second incident happened a few years later with the same group of friends. 
We set up camp in a little clearing surrounded by thick trees and settled around a campfire for the night. After it gets dark, we hear rustling in the trees and occasionally catch a flash of campfire reflecting off the ice in the distance. We aren't worried. This isn't bear country and this particular area is covered in deer. We had to stop a few times on the drive to this spot to let deer cross the road and we noticed tons of hoofprints and deer trails near our camping site whilst we were setting up. We go to bed, and all night long we hear the snapping of twigs and leaves. They sound like they're coming near the campsite a few times, but then back off when the dog starts barking. The next morning, we notice that there are fresh cougar prints skirting around the edge of our campsite. It's pretty obvious the cougar was circling us all night, sizing us up. We're dumb, young adults, and decided to test our luck, so we stayed a second night. That second night we decided to take shifts sleeping, with a few of us staying up to watch on guard, with our shotgun ready, and keep our fire tended during the night. Me and my ex had the first half of the night. Occasionally we would see a yellow flash of eyes for a brief moment, and they disappear again. The dogs would not shut up. Maybe it's just paranoia settling in, but my ex swears he saw the cougar off in the trees. At this point we all decide enough of testing fate and slept in our cars and left next morning. Next morning rolls around and our friend takes the dogs out for a small hike and one last potty break whilst we brewed some coffee. On our way back down the trail, they notice cougar tracks following theirs and we're all convinced we're being stalked. We decide to forget about coffee, tear down camp as quickly as possible, and no powder there. Number 13. An old guiding buddy of mine told me this story. And whilst I wasn't there myself, this happy-go-lucky hyper fella got really pale and quiet telling it. He would only tell it to me during the daytime after weeks of badgering and it was the only time I saw him scared in all the months we spent leading a group around Appalachia. So, my buddy Mark went camping in a state forest in Virginia with a group of his college friends. They were a small group of four from the outdoor rec department, experienced kids with all the necessary gear in familiar terrain. Being college kids, however, they rolled into the campsite fairly late, and decided to just jump and decided to just car camp, which is camping near the car, no hiking in separate locations. It was early evening, but still just before the sun had set. As they were unloading the car and setting up camp, two mangy fellas came out the woods and approached them. These guys looked like they'd been living out there for quite some time and acted very strangely. They wouldn't look you in the eyes and just really twitched and just seemed really twitchy, just kind of hanging around like they wanted something, like coyotes. My buddy Mark got an uncomfortable feeling right away. The guys introduced themselves. Now, nobody I've spoken to can remember the man's first name. It was something like Bill or Rick. But the second guy said his name was Gizmo. Funny, right? Hard to forget. So Gizmo and his friend began asking questions. Questions like, Are you all going to stay the night? How much food do you have? When are you kids supposed to be heading home? You've all got phones, right? And are there any more of you planning on showing up? Well, Mark didn't like this one bit. So he started telling tales. Yeah, there's going to be eight or ten of us or more showing up tonight and our parents expect us home first thing tomorrow morning. They're super paranoid, so we gotta get home on time or they'll call the cops. Parents, am I right? Ha, <laughs> that sort of thing. Gizmo and company poked around camp a bit more, then wished the group good luck and disappeared back into the woods. Mark and his friends joked nervously about Gizmo and his friend, but weren't worried enough to actually leave. They built a fire and cooked dinner, then cleaned, and hung up the bear bag. They spent the rest of the evening hanging out around the fire, chatting and drinking. 
One of them had a harmonica, I think. And by midnight, they all turned in, and they had brought two tents, a girl's tent and a boy's tent. Well, Mark didn't feel right in the tent. He felt like somebody needed to keep watch. So he slept by the fire. Sometime later, Mark found himself awake. The fire was dying when he opened his eyes, and he couldn't see much beyond the campsite, except for one bright burning spot. There was a light out in the woods. It bobbed along at chest height, occasionally disappearing behind the trees, sometimes pausing. Whoever it was, was a good distance away, maybe a hundred yards or so, and he followed it for a while until it went out. He stared into the darkness for a long time, until eventually he fell asleep once more. Suddenly Mark woke up again, this time in a panic. The fires were down to embers, barely glowing. He opened his eyes to see the strange light in the forest was back, and much closer now. He could see now, it was from a lantern. He watched as the lantern carved a smooth perimeter around the campsite, occasionally going out, always reappearing a short distance away. Mark pretended to roll on his back in his sleep so that he could watch it. It circled the campsite twice, getting closer each time. The strange thing is, there were no sticks breaking, no leaves crunching. Somebody trapezing around the dark woods, that that close should have made a lot more noise. Whoever it was was trying to be really quiet. Mark lay there, tense and unmoving. By the time it began its third rotation of the campsite, the lantern was so close that Mark could see a face illuminated on it. It looked like one of the fellas from earlier. He couldn't remember which one. His eyes were bugged out, scanning the campsite like a predator, and he was sweating. And then the lantern went out. At this point, Mark properly woke up. He got up and started making a lot of noise, stoking the fire, packing his gear. His watch read 4.30, and the sun wasn't up yet. He considered all of that happened, and made the tough call to wake his buddy and bug out. Nobody argued when they saw his face. Like I said, this guy is happy-go-lucky, and a human golden retriever, and an experienced woodman to boot. You'd believe him too. The sun was barely starting to come up, and by the time they got in the car, as they were driving out, they passed something that they hadn't noticed on their way in. There was an old RV parked out in the woods, camouflaged with a mixture of earth-coloured tarps and actual greenery. It was surrounded by a chain-link fence that was also draped with camo tarps and leafy broads. The whole thing looked like a long-term hunting campsite. Mark and his friends were actually relieved. Gizmo and his friends must have been poachers, and that would explain their creepy stalking behaviour. They had been trying to scare kids away from their campsite, Scooby-Doo style. Still cautious, they hightailed it out of there, and counted their lucky stars that they weren't dear. That should have been the end of the story. The next part I don't understand. I don't know why Mark or his friends didn't tell anyone about Gizmo for a few weeks. I would have thought for sure he'd report the poachers ASAP. He's very type A, and not typical for him to procrastinate or let rule go unenforced. I don't know what his excuse was, but Gizmo and his pal were forgotten. Then one day, Mark mentions the incident to a law enforcement officer from the DNR that came to lecture at one of his classes. She asks casual questions, just to be polite, but then stiffens at the mention of the name Gizmo. By any chance do you remember the other guy's name, she asked. No, it was something normal, but I don't remember. God, they always say that, she replied. Turns out that part of this woman's job was investigating the murders that occurred in Virginia State Forests. Most are body dumps for crimes that occurred elsewhere. But over the last decade, a series of unsolved cases, stretching all the way into West Virginia, had targeted what appeared to be random unrelated campers. But when they interviewed other campings in the area around the time of the murders, they all mentioned the same uncanny details. They had all been approached 
by an individual named Gizmo, and another man who nobody's name they can seem to remember. Number 14. I was camping with my family and friends up in the mountains, sharing a tent with my older brother Luke, and another friend called Evan. We weren't tired, and everyone retreated to their tents for the night. But the fire was dimming, and we were bored, so we went inside our tent to watch Adventure Time on my laptop. We all passed out after a few episodes, and I woke up sometime during the night into an episode of sleep paralysis. I have weird sleep habits, and experience sleep paralysis every few months or so. So for those of you who haven't had it, basically, you're awake but you can't move, and sometimes experience auditory and visual hallucinations. I was aware of this, so I didn't have a full-on heart attack when I started hearing shuffling noises outside my tent, which continued and got louder and closer until the fabric of the tent itself was being touched by something. My computer hadn't died yet, and I could see my surroundings in the dim light off the screen. I watched the fabric compress as something pushed against it sporadically about four feet off the ground, then moved around the tent towards me. I watched three distinct impressions follow this creature around the side of the tent. It looked like a claw. I was terrified and filled with adrenaline, but another part of me remained calm, assuring my body it was all a dream. I couldn't do anything, so my fear was pointless, but I continued to observe it and my sleep paralysis began to fade, and I realised I could move. No longer so was I convinced I was dreaming. I reached over and shoved Luke awake. I tried to get him to look, to see if there was really something out there. But I must have sounded like I was sleep talking because he just rolled over and went back to sleep waving me off. Eventually the rustling stopped, and I was tired and groggy enough that I fell back asleep. In the morning I'd completely forgotten about it. That's until my brother-in-law said to us, it's a good thing we put the dog in the car last night. There was a bear here, whilst we were sleeping. Dean pointed out the tree where we'd strung up our trash, and saw the fresh, gaping claw marks about nine feet deep up the trunk. That hit me hard. I had seen the bear, and calmly watched it test the fabric of my tent twelve inches from my face. Number 15. I went camping with the summer program when I was 16. Twelve other guys being managed by four adult men, and we were having a great time. S'mores, hot cocoa, campfire stories, the works. We all had to be in our tents, and either sleeping or awake, but quiet, by eleven. I was in a tent with two other guys, staying up later and just talking typical teenage guy stuff. As one guy is talking, I start to hear heavy breathing nearby, like someone has just been running and is out of breath. I ignore it and keep listening. I figure I'm just a weird kid hearing things, or that one of the guys in the next tent is making the noise whilst he sleeps. Then we hear, please, help me, from outside. It didn't sound like anyone in the group. It sounded like an old man out of breath. We all went dead quiet and listened to this guy's breath. Then asked again with a whimper at the end. I don't know what possessed this guy near the front of our tent, but he turned on a flashlight and opened the inner flap, but kept the outer zipped and looked out. We just see a pair of bare, old and scabbed pale legs standing there. It looked like this guy had been walking nude through the woods for some time. He asked for help and kept standing there. We were all paralysed with fear. But the guy at the front managed to say, keep walking down the trail. 
A ranger will be there soon. The guy stopped breathing and said, No, no rangers. They keep me here. It was at this point someone else finally spoke up. A chaperone came out of his tent with a flashlight and cautiously asked him how long he'd been there and what happened to him. The old man didn't answer. Just started sobbing and ran off into the woods. We saw by the flashlight that he was completely naked and emaciated. Number 16. This was maybe seven or eight years ago, when I was 20, and in a really bad way. I had been screwing up my life via heroin for the past year. But after a lot of help, love and luck from friends and family, finally, I was getting my head cleared. I was almost there, above the black tar hell I had gotten myself into. I decided to get out of the city and drove two hours out to a smaller town in Missouri where Google Maps told me a small campsite by water was. I knew that there shouldn't be very many campers because it had just gotten cold and was around 40 or so that night. Nearly there, as I'm driving down a misty morning road, just a picturesque straight two-line highway. There's this object laying in the road about half a mile up. I slow my approach and can see this shaggy mutt just hanging out. I stop and roll down my window right next to it. And she came up, licked my hand and wagged her tail a bit. She seemed to expect something of me. She had no tag, no tattoo for Chip, and was just a dog with no name. Naturally, I popped open the passenger side door for her, and she was so glad and hopped in. So now I've got this dirty but friendly companion with me for my little excursion, the dog with no name. The entrance to the campsite was only a half mile further. As I suspected, there was no one around. I just dropped a five in the honor box and picked the closest site to the stream. I set up my tent, the same one I did set up for years with my dad as a kid, collected some dry sticks and started a fire. The dog with no name just circled the campsite, looking content enough to sniff some leaves and roll around in the mud. I went to check out the rivulet, about 30 feet wide. It had a man-made stone dam that you could walk across. To the west was the deeper part of the river, sort of pooling at the dam, then maybe an eight-foot drop to the east into calmer streams. Instantly, I wanted to go on, cleanse myself, symbolize, baptize, whatever. I grew up Catholic, so that kind of shit runs through my head to this day, though I'm far from religious. The dog sees me scoping out the whole time from the campsite. I can't bring myself to do it though. I'm hugely disappointed in myself. But it's cold, it's brackish and I don't have a towel. So I go back up to smoke some cigarettes, eat hot dogs and pet the dog with no name. Night falls quickly after all this meditation and I roll inside the tent to sleep. My buddy sleeps inside the tent next to the sleeping bag. This dog was awesome. And I wake up in the middle of the night for no reason. I can't put my finger on it. And my main source of warmth, the dog with no name, is missing. I slide out the tent, as I assume I left it unzipped, and there she is, just sitting there waiting for me in the pitch black, wagging her tail. I feel very strange, like something is happening here, and someone slash something is telling me to get back down to the river and do the damn thing. We walk down the short trail together surrounded by Missouri black. It's even colder than before, but I start to strip anyway, standing on the chilly stones of the dam. The dog with no name sits on the edge of the river again, just watching me, a slight wag. I'm now stark naked as can be, staring into this black pool that looks like supernatural ink. 
I should mention here that I hate swimming in the water. I can't see the bottom of it, and my fearful imagination takes over and I freak out. In other words, I stand naked on the dam for over 10 minutes before I finally mustered up the balls and just dive into the blackness. It was cold as hell and scary as shit. When I came up for air, I was thrashing wildly back towards the dam, scrambling back onto the slick stones. I shook up my hair and was surprised how the adrenaline helped me keep warm. As I was picking up my shoes and clothes, I looked over for my buddy at the river's edge. The dog with no name was nowhere in sight. Back up the campsite. I look around gently whistling and that kind of thing. I'm more than woken up by now. So I go ahead and start another fire as dawn is just starting to break. I have another hot dog for breakfast and figure I might as well pack up and leave. This trip feels more than complete. I start my car up and check my phone. There is an hour time difference between the two. This happens to fall on daylight savings time. I'm not calling it a supernatural rip in time, but it's funny it was the night this went down. In fact, the exact time would have been around 3 or 4 a.m. the dog disappeared. So the dog never showed up again, and I never shot heroin again. Number 17. Whilst prospecting out here in the Caribou region, I came across a set of rock piles, known as Chinese piles, out in the middle of nowhere. These being here means someone did a lot of digging back in the old days. So I started working, and after an hour and a half had about 10 grams of gold, and was having a happy dance, when I noticed the small standing stones on each of the rock walls. Each stone had several Chinese characters on them, and in a moment of dread, I realised that they were graves. I put the gold in a glass bottle I found nearby and left it behind. I also took down drawings of the symbols to show to a local historian, who later confirmed my suspicions that yes, they were graves, and they likely hadn't been seen in over 150 years. Chinese miners believe that if a miner died on site, the ground became cursed by the fallen miner's spirit, so they wouldn't continue to mine the area, and they would tell anyone who they met in the area that it had been worked out. Sometimes they would do extra work to make it look like the site was finished off, so people wouldn't end up digging up their comrades. I've been back several times, but I won't dig there out of respect. The site's super creepy in the morning fog. You can almost see people's outlines sitting around the piles. One of the stories my boss out here told me involved some sketchy folk from Prince George back in the 70s and went with them looking for some mining gear to steal so they could claim jump a site a few kilometers down the road. My boss went down this forgotten path into a clearing with two ancient bulldozers and a small cabin. The rest went to the bulldozers to see if they ran whilst my boss went into the cabin and was greeted by a skeleton, laying in bed with a bullet hole in his head. They brought in the cops and they figured the guy had been there since 1935, since that was the last date on the papers inside. I went to the same cabin with him a few weeks back, but the place had been burnt down by quad bikers. Number 18. Just a few weeks ago, we made our way to a very remote valley that is very difficult to access. Think walking on one inch ledges, dropping into narrow crevices. The valley ends in a sharp drop, with a waterfall that is about a hundred feet high. We were almost at the drop when we heard a whistle. It sounded a lot like a hiking whistle but we only met one group of people that entire day, and they had stopped way before we did, as they thought the mountain slope was not passable. According to our calculations, that group should have left long ago and headed back to base camp, so it made no sense. Then we heard another whistle, and we yelled hello, 
and immediately we heard a whistle back. The whistle was coming up from the thick trees, on the very slope the mountain encircling the valley. The slope was about 75 to 80 degrees. The only way we could make it up there would be if we pulled ourselves up by tree branches and roots, because it was just too steep. Just as we were debating whether the whistling was indeed a hiker's, a helicopter suddenly rose from behind the waterfall. It rose right above us, then turned around and flew away. It was an unmarked helicopter, and the closest airfield is about a hundred miles away. We figured they must have had some search mission out for someone, so that must have been a hiker's whistle. However, it was really strange that a person could whistle repeatedly, but never yell back. We yelled again. The whistle recurred. Suddenly, we heard the helicopter rotor again, and not three or four minutes later, we saw the helicopter rise above the valley, hover for about 30 seconds and then fly away over the mountain. We went ahead and crossed the creek to climb the mountain slope. We scrambled up, grabbing onto roots and branches, and the whistling ceased. We yelled a few more times with no response. It took us four hours to make our way out of there. The bushes were so thick that we walked on branches above the ground, and I could not see my hands in front of me. I still have no idea who was whistling. It was a very mechanical whistle, and I've been out in the wilderness quite a few times, and have never heard a bird whistle in that way, or anywhere close to it. Number 19. This was an off-the-grid cabin, middle of nowhere, bring a few kegs and everyone you know, and let's get wrecked situation. This was incredibly secluded because of my friend's property. He owns about nine square miles of untouched land near Ward, Colorado. We are, or we should be, the only human beings for miles. There's probably a couple dozen of us. And this is the middle of nowhere. And if memory serves, the original plan was to camp in tents around a bonfire. But it pretty quickly became more of a blizzard situation with low visibility, high winds and frostbite levels of cold. This leaves us crammed into maybe a 600 foot square cabin to get wrecked in and pass out in a pile. No swear, we're all friends. Sometime in the middle of the night, everyone's quietening down and I need a cigarette and a pee. I stumble, pretty wasted, into my coat and boots and throw on several hats. I go outside and the wind has slowed a bit and the moonlight makes everything coated in ice and snow shine like diamonds. I light my cigarette and walk 20 feet into the woods to pee. Something every Colorado kid knows by heart is the frostbite wind chill chart. The fact that in this weather, flesh freezes in 25 minutes. It's hard to forget when your John's out. Midstream though, I hear something or someone, another 20 or 30 feet in the woods. Though, it sounds like a human's voice. The wind makes it hard to hear, and the snow and dark made it impossible to see. I manage to wiggle my smoke to the corner of my mouth, and muster up my best mountain man voice and yell, Anyone there? Still pissing a river. It takes a second for me to hear a reply. Come over. In a voice that sounds exactly like my best friend, the kid who owns the cabin, you okay, Jay? I call out. Nothing. So I zip up, go to trudge further out to make sure he's alright, and just as I'm stubbing up my smoke, I hear my name called much louder and clearer from the cabin. I yell back that I'm okay, and head back to the cabin with a curious glance behind me. Who's waiting at the door? The person who was waiting for me at the door, I swear was the kid who was talking to me in the woods. I told him I heard something. He told me I was drunk, but he trusted me enough to humor me by helping me with a headcount. There was nobody missing. I tried to forget about the whole thing, but I was very glad to be sleeping well armed in good company that night. What would have happened if I'd have headed out further? 
Number 20. My family used to camp in Algaquin Park in Ontario when I was a kid. We used to do a lot of day hikes with our dog. The dog was a crazy runner and would run up and down the trail back and forth between my parents and older brother and myself. This one trail ended in a lookout. My brother and I stopped to take in the view and my dog arrived seconds later traveling at full speed. He attempted to apply the brakes, but the momentum carried him right over the edge. We freaked out. Our dog had just gone over a cliff and it was a good 50 or 60 foot drop. I ventured over to the edge to look. My dog had somehow landed on one ledge that sat about 10 feet down. Shit, what now? Any movement and my dog would fall the rest of the way. It was a sheer face and no way to get down. And then out of the blue, from a trail behind, appears a hiker with full climbing gear. Algaquin is not an area known for a lot of climbing, and I've never seen anyone before or since with gear on that trail. The guy belayed down, rescued my dog, packed up and left. He didn't even stick around long enough to grab his name. To all intensive purposes, he just returned to the trail and vanished. I think I've unlocked the mysterious stranger perk from Fallout. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. Wow, 50,000 of you. I'm still in awe. Thanks again, everyone. I'm also sorry for not posting anything for the last two days. As some of you may know, my wife is currently seven months pregnant with our baby girl. And we spent the whole weekend painting her space, building a crib, and reorganizing the whole apartment to prepare for her arrival in February. You'd think that these things don't take much time, but they really do. Painting the room, for example, took me about five hours. Not because it's big by any means, but the amount of work that goes into cleaning the walls before, applying the masking tape, putting down the newspaper, and then, of course, the two coats of paint and the cleanup. I was so exhausted, and I finished so late that there was simply no time to make a video. And yesterday, we spent most of our day at one of those courses that hospitals run to prepare you for your baby. You know, what to expect during labor, how to look after the baby when it's born, stuff like that. But, at the very least, I hope it gave some of you guys time to catch up with some previous videos. And we should be going back to daily now. But sincerely, thank you so much for watching. Everyone, please remember to subscribe, drop a like, and leave a comment with your thoughts to help with that pesky algorithm. But for now, guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next one.